it is here the season of advent and uh some new readings uh, and i preached about the antiphon the o antiphon or great antiphon on emmanuel yesterday and often the last week before christmas um, sometimes the whole month the great antiphons are used for prayer and scripture so i'm going to use several throughout uh, this time and um, also I'm going to break with tradition and talk about Christmas before Christmas gets here <laughs> because I've had this book on my shelf Christmas the Festival in of Incarnation by Donald Heinz for a number of years and I've always wanted to read it and guess what I haven't read it so we're going to read parts of it this month I think you'll like it he's a Lutheran pastor and uh, comes at this with a thoughtful, thoughtful mind. So today, to begin, I'm going to uh, call us to prayer using Amos 5.8. I'm going to read the first antiphon uh, on wisdom in this case, and then read the Hebrew Testament lesson from Isaiah 11 that goes with it. Seek God, who made the Pleiades and Orion, who turns deep darkness into morning and darkens the day into night, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the surface of the earth. The Lord is God's name. This is the first antiphon. O highest wisdom, come while reaching end to end, in sweetness ordering all. To us, O mighty Savior, discerning judgment, teach. And from Isaiah 11, 2 to 3. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. And now for the reading. Christmas Festival of Incarnation by Doug Hines. I'm sorry, Donald Hines. Every year comes a happy array of books for Christmas. They line up home decorating and fancy parties, poems and stories and cookies, the latest way to stimulate the children, proper lamentations on materialism, even a dose of piety, all the necessary rehearsals required for playing a great festival. This is a different play. This book is a religious and historical accounting of Christmas as an ever evolving festival of incarnation. Generically, incarnation refers to any divine being who takes on human form, literally flesh, and comes to live on earth for a time. In Christian theology, incarnation refers to the belief that Jesus Christ, identified as the second person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, came to earth as fully divine and fully human. As such, Christ represents and demonstrates the fully human presence of God on earth, enacting a divine plan for the redemption and salvation of humankind. The drama of incarnation, a central theme of this book, is the risk God takes in becoming human and fully immersed in and committed to a material world. This book tells the amazing story of how an original religious festival celebrating the one-time incarnation of God that is the heart of Christianity relentlessly expanded the divine investment in material culture and laid down vast deposits in the Western tradition. The incarnational plot opens with the original Christmas story and its protagonists embedded in the texts of the New Testament. In the second act, Christianity comes to understand itself as a theater of incarnation with the church as its festival house. And finally, spilling far beyond sacred pages and liturgical auspices, there spreads across time and place the cathedral square and market and home, 
an expanding range of human celebration until all the world becomes the stage for Christmas. That the daring idea of incarnation, thought by Christians to represent a surprising and profound divine departure, and soon enough embodied in the church's teaching and practice, should become a pregnant theme from which unending and unauthorized development flows, this is the fullness of Christmas to which I bear witness. The incarnation was not going to remain a pristine idea in the mind of God, or even in the flesh of Jesus Christ, or even in the church that calls itself the body of Christ. The incarnation would become a divine human venture, including not only marches of pilgrims drawn to festival, but every imaginable prop piling up on stages everywhere. My account must become greater than the sum of its parts, and the ambitions of this story run to a large stage. I hope to offer readers much more than they have been prepared to expect, and to surprise them with how little of the panoply of Christmas the December crowds see. More is the underlying theme in a jaded time that wonders if that's all there is. To be sure, Christmas is resplendent even from afar and ready to delight. It is easy to see and hear and feel the festival well before getting around to believing it up close. Like the figure of Christ, Christmas is a treasure trove embedded in the history of the West. But where is the treasure today? And how much of the gold is left? Some say that Christmas has dwindled into the festival of consumerism, and they call it the civil religion of capitalism. Indeed, Christmas without religion is now more imaginable than Christmas with, without shopping. Others, in order to provide good holiday value for a pluralist society, change the subject to winter holiday and many domestic uh, religious do, many domesticate religious festival as good family times shopping solstice social ability is that all there is even if one buys the view that the american christmas is an invented tradition of questionable provenance or that it has been turned into a seasonal commodity bought and sold in the global market, the hope may linger that there is more to it, more than meets the acquisitive holiday eye. This book displays the more. A contemporary visitor to St. Paul's in London pauses at the tomb of the cathedral's great architect, Christopher Wren, to make out the epitaph. If you seek his monument, look around. A festival of incarnation invites wide-angled amazement. To offer a fully dimensional account of Christmas in the human landscape, some triangulations are necessary. What is today called an interdisciplinary approach? Theology has an ear for distinctly spiritual ideas and practices and does not reduce religion to its footprints in politics or popular culture or economics. The sociological imagination finds a way into the resilience, the homeliness, and the ambiguity of what is lately called lived Christianity, meaning a humanly constructed church channeling God on the ground. With a keen eye for festival and for ritual, anthropology spots the formation of a distinctive Christian culture inside the church and the exuberant and uncontrollable impulse to carry material culture and deep play into every human precinct. Great religious festivals spin God into every matter, and religion becomes complicit in forces it cannot control. But simply to plot Christmas as capitalist religion misses too much of the story and wrongly implies that the values of the market are the final stage of human evolution. One might have thought that beginning the study of religious festival with its theology would be obvious but much of contemporary scholarship fails to get Christmas because its angles of approach are too narrow. A distinctly religious approach to Christmas is an overdue assignment. Curators who mount exhibitions of religious art find that their audiences must learn modern assumptions and relearn what people in other times knew by heart. 
just as musicians today try to recover the performances practice, performance practices of earlier times. A retrieval of the audience practices of historic Christmases would be fruitful for those who seek a full hearing of Christmas today. Neither concert halls, nor museums, nor even the town square and market are the seminal festival sites. But social sciences also offer indispensable insights. Anthropologists claim that looking closely into great cultural performances, like religious festivals, offers large payoffs in human self-understanding. We come to see the dramas that run beneath life and society and the fuller proportions of the human project, the stories we tell ourselves and the rituals in which we annually act them out are ideal locations to mine and understanding of our attempts to create meaning in the world, to spin ourselves in webs of significance. A thick description of Christmas offers something for everyone, if also the larger portrait that has gone missing. Christians may trace the contours of liturgical celebration and fret whether Christianity's major festival is slipping through their fingers. A aesthetes who love Christmas for its visual art or music find much on display here. Celebrators of popular culture and revisionists of kitsch can greet them in these pages. Fans of C.S. Lewis or Tolkien and those who believe magical realism can save a disenchanted world, can renew their hopes. Boundary tenders on the church state patrol can sharpen their watch. Political and economic commentators can register hope or dismay in Christmas as the site where the rival civilizations of religion and the market clash. Those of dramatic bent may imagine that the guerrilla theater that is liturgy and ritual could stage authentic alternatives to commodified culture. Curmudgeons can hear their own echoes in all those who have said no to Christmas. Those who believe human renewal lies in the good old days will find less and more. Even bon vivant, who only want to match guests with food and wine, will find fulfillment. Christmas inaugurates and plays out the risks and realizations of incarnation. To watch the festival of Christmas over time is to glimpse the descent of God into human festival, the religious spinning of divine into matter. One could imagine religious festival as fluorescent, absorbing light of invisible wavelength and emitting light of visible through some, those sometimes flickering wavelength. To just those audience who take to the lighted stage of the great religious house is to enlist in the disturbing ambiguities of religion and apt, accept parts in the play called the spiritual quest. To pour out into the streets where Christmas is also staged is to encounter disturbing course of incarnation in the world. Will it ruin things for the reader if I reveal now that it turns out that the celebration of Christmas becomes the uneasy record of how God and religion and humans are faring in the modern world? Plotting incarnation, he says. Today Christmas is wrapped in modern culture, but it was born in sacred texts written 2,000 years ago that proclaim the incarnation of God in Christianity's seminal idea. How did this come to be? How did incarnation turn into Christmas? How does Christmas reveal the long march of incarnation? God's apparent change of heart brought Jesus into the world as a startling new divine self-revelation. In the Christian view, a fusing of God as God with God becoming human turned the world upside down and was proclaimed as good news for the human condition. The poignant story of Jesus as God undergoing change for humanity's sake required the uniquely Christian sacred texts that the church came to call the New Testament. The New Testament is the original source for the incarnation and the authorization for celebrations of Christmas that make God matter everywhere. 
the great festival emerged, as did the New Testament itself, in oral tradition, written word, liturgical celebration, and lived religion. Every, early Christianity celebrated Christmas listening to Matthew and Luke, read in public worship, and the words achieved incantatory power for hearers already distanced from the time of Christ. Would things turn out over time? This book closes worrying about the risk of incarnation. That is, has the festival of Christmas turned out the way God intended? The great idea that Christianity calls incarnation requires that God suffer the consequences of coming out in earthly context from the crucifixion of Jesus to the unsteadiness of his followers. The New Testament and early Christianity tell the stories of the divine child taken into the hands of strangers. Extended over time, the festival of Christmas plays the unpredictable descent of the divine into every human matter. Incarnational change and development were inevitable. Sacred narratives do not stay put, as subsequent readers and hearers carry them with the child into new worlds. Their theological definitions and their leading characters come loose from ancient moorings, escape ecclesiastical control, and evolve in response to changing human contexts. Incarnations, or enculturations, as missionaries call them, keep happening. This is witness to the carrying capacity of incarnation, if also its susceptibility to reckless adventure. Playing out the point and peril of incarnation, Christian history demonstrates a continuing return to the sources. For return of the people of God from their many detours and for the renewal of their iconic festivals. Although some people can still recite Luke's account by heart from hearing it read in church or annually by Charlie Brown, it is mostly not the custom in the modern, self-confident West to look back to earlier times and sources for present direction. It is said that Americans are innocent of historical perspective, and that truism may apply to Bible believers as well. Attempts to understand a festival rooted in ancient, not to mention sacred, history are likely to be overwhelmed by present manifestations. Christmas now overwhelms Christmas then, and may be mostly discontinuous. Although ancient Christians made pilgrimages to Bethlehem in order to keep their holy texts alive, it is a challenge for 21st century celebrators to cross the threshold of everyday experience into the lost world of first sightings. To be sure, Christianity believes that the incarnation of God proclaimed in the New Testament has authorized a trajectory that reaches far beyond Bethlehem and well beyond ancient texts as well. Christmas has turned into an entire Christian culture and taken up residence beyond lived Christianity as well. That is the larger story of this book. And tomorrow we will turn to the original texts of Christmas. Each of these days I'm going to close with the prayer, since we're working on the old highest wisdom antiphon, let us pray. Lord God, fill our hearts with your love and our minds with your wisdom so that our actions will be pleasing to you. May your peace, which surpasses all understanding, guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus through your Holy Spirit. And in the words of the prayer Christ taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow.